Today is March 26th, 2018, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 83. Today on the show, we are talking about the challenges of pressing buttons, fixing the science of psychology, and we're taking a look at some new startups. Have you have we pressed your buttons lately? Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome. Joined today, remotely, from Boston, it's Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, hello, everybody. Hey, there he is. Blake, how's Boston? Oh, it is so wonderful. Nick, I have actually never been in a place where it only kind of snows a little bit, just enough to be annoying, but yeah. I still love it. Yes, it is. I don't know. I, I have never been to Boston or Massachusetts, and I have to say I love the city. I love the. I even like the cold weather. It's a great place. Well, that's awesome. Hey, if you're listening and you're in Boston, say hi to Blake. Reach out to him. I'm sure he'll like to you know, connect with our listeners and, and just have a beer with you or something. But Blake, we got to get into some stuff. I'm curious to hear about your experience at the Healthcare Symposium so far, but we'll get into that a little bit later. What's been going on with you this week? Oh, man, Nick, I had the best human factor story ever for you this week. So this is a, a conference where it's centered around human factors in healthcare, right? Or it's, it's called the, the Healthcare Symposium. So there you go. But there's one thing in this particular hotel that is driving all the human factor people mad, and it is the elevator system. So traditionally, <laughs> an elevator, you have a button that you would press right next to the door that would allow it to, like, you know, come down or, or go up, depending on which way you wanted to go. Well, in this case, they've replaced the typical buttons that you would actually have for an elevator with a touchscreen in which you select the floor no. you would like to go to, and then... Keep in mind, there's about 10 elevators you can choose from. After selecting the floor you'd like to go to, it gives you a little map that you have to follow to go find the correct elevator to get in so that you can reach your final destination. That is um, bonkers. And if, well, if that wasn't crazy enough, when you get in that elevator, there are still no buttons. There are zero buttons in the elevator at all. So if you get on an elevator going up and it's not going to the correct destination, you are just out of luck. So you have to get off and try it again. Let me just get this straight. So you have to input not only that you want to take an elevator, but you have to input the floor that you want to get on, and it tells you which elevator to get on to get to that floor? Yep, it does. And it's uh, – it's so, okay, I, t- I kind of get the design a little bit. Like, it's, it's much more efficient. You select the button for the floor you want to go to, and it says, like, okay, go jump on this elevator because there are so many possibilities here as far as elevators. Um and then when you get on, like, it, it, before you get on, it shows you, like, okay, you're going to go to the fourth floor or whatever possible floors you could be stopping at. Um, and then it, it's not bad, but somebody pointed out something super important earlier today to me, and they were like, I see some of the efficiency measures in this, but what about people that are older that maybe can't run to the elevator that is opening? Because sometimes it's pretty fast, and if it shuts, it shuts. Like, I, I've even not made it into one of the elevators earlier. So it's it's a... I don't know. It's it's just been kind of hilarious in the fact that it's a human factors conference and we're all talking about redesigning this specific elevator system. That's pretty awesome, man. I, I got to say, like, nothing brings human factors folks together like bad design, right? <laughs> speaking exactly, of, man. Speaking of bad design, man, I had the worst experience today. And uh, I'm sure some of our listeners can relate to this. Blake, have you ever worked for hours on something and then lost all of your data? Oh, yeah. It's uh, it's really a sad, sad have, situation. Have you ever done that when you're under a, a hard deadline? And, uh, oh, of course. Yeah. Have you ever done that when you're under a hard deadline and you took work home with you this weekend and worked for five hours on your on your thing and then have it happen oh, Monday wow. morning? No. <laughs> oh. oh, Nick, that sounds awful. That that happened to me. So I'm asking, why is it possible that this this still happens, right? I hit save. 
and I was working off a temporary file, right? And I feel like there should be some sort of error prevention there that says, hey, you're working off a temp file. Do you want to save a new copy? And I feel like I've seen that dialogue before, but it just didn't happen this morning. So I saved it, closed the thing, and realized my file wasn't on the desktop. So I go to check like all the temporary files, took it to the IT guy at work, and he was like, sorry, you're SOL. And I was like, all right, well, uh, that was five hours that I spent this weekend out the window. So <laughs> that was my day. <laughs> That is incredibly awful, man. That's no good. What? So is, is there anything you could have done differently, or is it just like yes. they should totally fix it? No, there is something I could have done differently, which is like just just get in the habit of file save as a new file when you're like, if you want to be super sure. But like I, I was like 90% sure I had a file working off the desktop, but I guess I was just working off a temporary file. I don't know. That's a bummer, though, that it didn't even show up in the temps. Oh, yeah. man, so bad. Yeah. That is that is kind of a gnarly design problem, right? Like, if if things, like, are typically, typically autosave nowadays, like, why can't it just make sure that it, le- at the very least, save the metadata to a file that you can get to? Because yeah. it can't take up that much space on your hard or, drive for that Or kind of recents, stuff. even. Like, it didn't even show up in recents. It was, it was really, uh, really upsetting. But, man, okay, so we got a lot to cover today because you're over there in Boston. We got some exciting news here on the, the Human Factors Cast side of things. Uh, first off, I want to shout out to Glenn for joining our Human Factors Cast Slack channel, and you can too, following the link in the show notes. It's on our Twitter. Uh, I found out today that the Twitter link that we have up there is a bit.ly link, and somebody reported it as spam. So uh, just ignore that. Continue on. It's it's a Slack invite. Just do it. But the most exciting things, Blake, Blake, you and I this week – uh, put together a Patreon refresh because we looked at, we took a hard look at our, our Patreon and, and said, you know what, this isn't working. Um, these rewards are not worth it to the people who listen to the show because what, what we want to do first and foremost is, is every Patreon uh, pledge basically goes into feeding the show directly. Like I said, this show is ad free. We are completely 100% supported by listeners like you. And we thought that our Patreon rewards just were not cutting it, right? I think we had, like, a special email. Like, you could run an advertisement on our show if you had something. And those would be the only ads that we ran. But we ultimately came to the decision that this was not working. So, <clears throat> Blake and I have been talking over the last couple months. And uh, we put together this thing. So, I'm going to go over the reward tiers. And then, uh, you know, if you like the show... And if you feel like this is something you can do, we would greatly appreciate it. So first off, you can donate as a human factors practitioner. This is level one. This is $1 or more a month. And what we'll do is we'll say, hey, thank you very much. We'll send you an email. We'll even call your name out on the show, thanking you for your support. And what also happens is if you join us on Slack, you'll get access to our Patreon subscribers only channel. Now, what this has is show notes and exclusive content. Whatever exclusive content is, that's TBD. But we do have some Patreon-only uh, channel in our Slack. And what's nice about that is that we post the show notes. And so what you can do, we post them ahead of time. So what you can do is you can come in, you can comment on uh, the stuff, and maybe your comment ends up on the show. Uh, so that's that's level one. Level two here is the Human Factors Engineer. Now, this is $5 or more per month. And I know what you're thinking. That's That's quite a bit of money. Now, that's okay, though, because what we're doing is we're bringing you a whole new podcast. Now, we're, we haven't come down on a name. Right now, it's Human Factors Cast Road Rage. But again, that name isn't final. Details on that are coming soon. I know. But, but basically what that is, I have a long commute, and Blake likes talking to me. So what we're going to do is, is, is once a week, we're going to just kind of hang out while I drive home on my hour commute. Now, this could be human factors related, but not necessarily. This is just kind of an extra piece as a, as a there's no agenda with these. So it's, it's just kind of a, uh, an ad lib podcast. But I mean, I'm sure we'll talk a lot about human factors stuff that happened to us during that day. Kind of think about the banter section, but just a little bit more of that. So if you like that, that's $5 or more per month and you get everything that the, the first level gets uh, as well. So, Next level is Human Factor Scientist. Now, this is $10 or more a month. This is, uh, this is something that I've kind of wanted to give back to the community, right? Blake and I have been thinking about how can we give back to you guys who are supporting us. So what we're going to do for this tier, you'll get everything else that I've already described, but you'll also get a one-time heuristic or professional review of one of your personal products. So this could be anything from like a resume or portfolio, LinkedIn profile, whatever it is. Um, 
We will review it and we'll include personalized feedback tailored to whatever you are trying to accomplish, right? So whatever your goal is, we'll go ahead and take a look at that product and we'll give our feedback as people in the field. Now, our last tier is a $20 or more per month. And this one, again, you get everything else. You get the professional review. You get the Human Factors Cast Road Rage. You get the email and access to our Patreon channel. What this last thing offers is exclusive access to our VIP meetups at live events. So Blake's out there in Boston. We're both going to be hopefully in in, uh, Philly this year for HFES. And we have exclusive events that you guys are going to be VIP members to if you uh, support this level. So this allows you to hang out with us, the host of the show, and uh, we will buy you a drink. So that is our new revamp Patreon. I think that's a lot better than what it was. And hopefully, you know, you'll see the value in that, too. And, and just we hope to get a couple more of you on to help support the show. Wow, that was a lot, Blake. What do you think of our Patreon stuff? <laughs> Oh, I'm super stoked on it. I love the the hierarchy progression from practitioner to engineer to scientist to honorary staff. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I love it too. And and honestly, I hope I hope you guys uh, think this is worthwhile. If if there's something else you want to see, please, we are open to suggestions. Join us on our Slack. Let us know what you guys want from us. Uh, you know, and and again, it just helps the entire community because we stay afloat from you guys. Okay. I know I've bumped the Patreon a whole lot, and uh, I know it, it, it's always like awkward begging for money. So <laughs> I don't know how else to transition. But Blake, well, I mean, it's it's something that we want to keep doing, right? And it's it helps us keep keep pushing out content and potentially doing more content by being able to get support from the community. But you know, only do what you can, type of thing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, so let's go ahead and plug some events. Blake, you're out there in Boston until the 28th. Uh, at the Healthcare Symposium. We got Computer uh, Human Interaction Conference in Montreal, Canada. That's April 23 through 26. We'll also have coverage from that. And HFES Australia uh, 2018 is in Perth. That's 26 through 28 of November. Uh, So if you are around and, uh, you know, have interest in any of those please go uh i think we'll have coverage for all of those maybe maybe the australia one uh we'll see if mateo can can give us some commentary uh but okay blake let's go ahead and get into the human factors news this is the part of the show where we break down everything related to the field of human factors this could be anything from medical transportation psychology medical healthcare is is especially relevant this week not in our news stories, but because you're there, Blake. Uh, you name it. As long as it relates to the field of human factors, it's their game. Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right. So pressing a button appears effortless, and it's pretty easy to dismiss how challenging it actually is. But researchers at Alto University in Finland and Keist in South Korea created detailed simulations of button pressing with the goal of producing human-like presses. The researchers created a new method for changing the way buttons are activated called impact activation. So instead of activating the button at first contact, it actually activates when the button cap or finger hits the floor with a maximum maximum impact. So this technique was 94% more precise and rapid tapping than the regular activation method for a push button that's 37% more precise than a regular touchscreen button using a capacitive sensor. This research actually suggests that the highest, that high travel clicky keys, so kind of mechanical pe- keyboards with switches from tactile keyboard makers, should be better for us neurologically than keyboards with less precise travel, and shows us that the best input methods are physical and not from the touchscreen variety. So it's it's kind of funny, Nick. This this study really gets at the fact that how inefficient touchscreens are. Uh, as far as the feedback that they're providing us and we get a lot more misclicks, I'm just wondering why nobody's kind of dealt with that before uh, and how we could even kind of bring some of these ideas that tactile buttons are a lot better for us into something like a smartphone. Yeah, so, I mean, we've seen uh, sort of these designs on smartphones before where these startups or or whatever will, uh, they have these sort of um, hybrid screens where they will raise uh portions of it to become actual tactile input methods right so it but but it still has the same problem is it doesn't have that click the the satisfying have you ever used a mechanical keyboard 
No, you know, I haven't. And I've been meaning to get one just to try it because I always thought that it was they, they were just like super loud and I didn't really see the benefit. But I definitely from at least reading about it and listening to people talking about it that actually code a lot, that it's it's a lot more salient about like where your hands are and it helps you kind of get that or stop finger pecking as much because I'm not the best typer. I've heard a lot of people say that it helps them out with being more precise in their movements. Absolutely. Like I am not being hyperbolic when I say it is life changing. When I got my mechanical keyboard, obviously I switched for the show. Uh, I didn't want to do a mechanical keyboard because you'd hear the click clack while, while we're recording, but uh, a mechanical keyboard is leaps and bounds more responsive, at least in my opinion, to, to any sort of keyboard I've ever used. And it makes sense. This study makes sense to me. Um, and it, it was it was good to kind of see that the it, the science backs it up, you know. Most definitely, and it was it was kind of helpful to watch the YouTube video they included in this study, which you can find in our Slack from this week's stories. But it, it really showed the the differences in what they're talking about because at a high level, when the, when you hear it, like okay, you're you're having a better or more precise experience using a keyboard versus a touchscreen, which somewhat makes sense. But if when I first read it, I was like, I don't see how that can even be true, right? Because I use my phone, I use my smartphone keyboard and other gestures that include me, like basically clicking on the screen all the time. I've gotten to have got, I have to have gotten better at it. But then when they break down the difference between, you know, regular input or, of keyboard and touchscreen and then they go into this impact activation which they they talk about the theory behind it a little bit you can see how it it would be more precise but if you're having to like create much more force and you're not it's not just like touching a key it's actually you know activating it forcefully Uh, so that was helpful to really get an understanding of what what's going on here yeah absolutely and i gotta i gotta plug this really quick so these guys are gonna be at uh chi kai they're gonna be at kai uh in april so Maybe maybe we could have our, our field correspondent Woodrow reach out to these guys and see if they can get uh, an interview or something because the, the it's really cool they they published three papers on it that are going to be presented next month. Um, yeah, and the neuromechanics aspect of it, like I would love to pick their brains about how that how that even works or where they even came up with the the idea that it was something worth looking into because it, again they they do mention how it's it kind of feels like a mundane thing that we do every day but maybe the impact of different kinds of button presses could make you know your ability to understand the space that you're in a little bit better or use technology more efficiently so i don't, I don't know it'd be cool to talk to them i don't know man maybe maybe the hypothesis would be much more apparent to you if you used a, a mechanical keyboard because i've had that same thought i was like man this is just so much more uh uh, psychologically satisfying to use, right? And so, like, I, I can't imagine. <laughs> I, I can imagine somebody going, "Yeah, let's study this." You know? So, all right. Well, what, let's go ahead and get into our next story here. All right. So, this is a really important one for psychology. So, a cascade of warning signs in the field of psychology around all at once in 2011. So, famous psychological exper- experiments failed over and over when researchers tried to replicate them. And even worse, the standard methods researchers used in their labs turned out to be wishy washy enough to prove, you know, just about anything. So, nonsense claims turned up in major journals, and it was a moment of crisis. And something called reformist psychologists think that the problem was researchers had too many degrees of freedom in, their, in performing their studies. So, as psychologists conduct experiments, they make decisions after decision after decision that can bias their results in ways p in ways p values alone can't detect. But increasingly, these reformist psychologists have started pushing pre-registration, so a mechanism designed to limit those degrees of freedom. So pre-registration means that before you collect data for a study, you write down a plan of what you're going to do. So these decisions include things like what variables psychologists will analyze, how many subjects they'll include, how they'll exclude bad subjects, all that gets written down in advance and published somewhere with with a timestamp so that other researchers can go back and check it out. And the idea is that without too many degrees of freedom, researchers won't find themselves drifting towards false positive results. So Nick, I read this story earlier when I was taking a break, and I cannot wait to hear you talk about this because I know that bad science is really a big 
pet peeve of yours. Oh, it is. Let me let me back up and kind of define what pre pre registration is. So that means before you collect any data for a study, you write down a plan of what you're going to do. You identify everything that you might have to make decisions about along the way, and you make those decisions in advance, right? Contingency plans, basically. You you basically create a contingency plan for your study. If something unexpected comes up, I don't know what you're going to do. Um, but I I really like this idea, and I. I like this idea because it's kind of the way I've always conducted research in my own experience, right? I've always kind of said, okay, let's let's lay everything out in front. And obviously things change as time goes on and you'll have to encounter some unexpected thing that you didn't even know was going to be a thing, right? Like um like like perhaps if you are walking to some place that you're going to get a distance estimate and it's it's a little bit higher up and so maybe the increased blood flow might uh cause you to overestimate the distance or something you know those types of things um that maybe or even like what do you do with a bad participant or how you define that right exactly i mean these are all things that with pre-registration you'd have to write down in advance time stamp it and say look these are the things i thought of before um go and try to replicate this thing and i like it i like it from the replication standpoint right um now, this article does offer a couple of criticisms of this of this method uh, where it kind of gives too much credit to a, a narrow kind of scientific work, work which is uh, hypothesis te testing, right? And again, that's kind of the classic way that I've been trained. So, but, but that's not, you know, how exploratory research works. And so I think, I think maybe just having a more critical eye as it, pertains to exploratory research and trying to implement some of these pre-registration elements obviously um you know like you can still do exploratory research if you say like look these are these are the the um data points we're going to gather and uh we have no hypothesis and uh we're you know we're going to test a couple different variables these are the tests we're planning to run um and then maybe like if you find something that wasn't laid out in that argument beforehand, uh, then maybe you just kind of uh, like this is this an emergent feature that we didn't account for and that we couldn't have seen. So I don't I don't know, man. It's it's a it's a tough call. Yeah, I think it's one of those where it's it's a good start, but it'll have to evolve. I mean, the the biggest thing this spoke to me when I was reading was this stops you from being able just to data mine. Uh, to like it, it hit it a data set that you collect and just try and find some kind of significant values in it without having any kind of specific outcome that you were looking for or any hypothesis. And I, I even think the exploratory research uh, relevant can be taken care of by if you have to fill out, let's say, like some pre-registration where you're up front, like you said, you define what you think you're looking at, the variables you're going to take a look at. And if you go through all the analyses and you just you just find nothing or something else came up as you did the analysis then file kind of like uh, it, it wouldn't be free registration at this point but file like an, a, an amend a, uh, amendment or an appendum to a, your original pre-registration and say hey this is what i found at this point i want to explore x y and z uh, so i feel like there's ways around it but yeah i, I don't know i think i like the idea it's it's funny that they're called reformists because that sounds just that sounds really militant like to me when I read it. I don't know why, but I I think it's a good step in the right direction for science in general, especially psychology, um, and, because it's it's something that I love and something in science is something I hold in a high regard, uh, both in a like hardcore science role, but also in in kind of a moral thing as well, right? Because you you want you want research that comes out to be good and things that things that you can actually trust and think about implementing in your own life. If it has to do with like, you know, neurology or moral behavior or any of that kind of stuff. And, and also I have, I mean, I have a background in psychology. I want to continue to believe in right. its integrity and things like this help. Yeah. I mean, the truth of the matter is people who conduct research are scientists and the public is supposed to trust scientists. And it's hard to do that when you run studies and you're not doing good science and you're just publishing stuff because you're trying to make a quota. It's not good science. And I know it's, it's, it's that battle of the institution versus 
uh, the individual and, and science. And it's just it's it's unfortunate that that's the situation that we're in. But if you can do good science, do good science. And I think this is one good way. And again, like you said, Blake, I don't think this completely kills exploratory research. Right. You can still lay out the methods. You can still lay out the data points that you're gathering. You can lay out everything except for your hypotheses. This this, you know, kind of. uh conforms to that as well so i the only thing that it's missing that you can't write down at least to me is the hypothesis so yeah that's true i i feel like it's a kind of a weak argument against it um because the more and you're supposed to do this anyway you're supposed to come up with your methods and everything ahead of time you're supposed to come up with the uh with the significance testing that you're going to do ahead of time you're supposed to come up with all this at, at before you even run the data at least that's how I've See, always been trained. Yeah, and Nick, that's it's kind of where I'm getting frustrated and confused in my head is I, I need to like dig into the, this article that was written and then who wrote it and figure out where they're what research they're talking about in 2011 that started to get so disproved and failed over and over because so, like you, I have the same mentality of you do a lot of this before and I know a lot of people that I worked with or was trained by like they hold themselves to these standards and the students they've trained under these standards too. So I'm a little confused about where it's happening. Yeah. So, so this, this thing that they're referencing, um, this is that big study that happened, <clears throat> sorry, back in 2011 where they, they tried to recreate something like, um, uh, what was it? Uh, I'm looking for the details now, but they, they tried to replicate 27, quote, important findings in social psychology uh, by following the same methodology. It was the replication study. Does this Is this ringing a bell? Um, it, it is. I just, it's, a, it's one of those that I want to dig more into. Oh, yeah, that, yeah. Because, yeah. Yes. But, but anyway, yeah, I mean, keep going. It's, it's, it's probably good to refresh everybody on where it came from. Yeah, so there's this big replication study that happened where the scientists set out to basically replicate all these important findings. And, and what they found was that I, I think the, the statistic is cited in that, that article that we covered this week, but um, a, a large number of them couldn't be replicated, even following the same exact procedures written out in the methods. So uh, what this, what this article that we're talking about now is trying to do is saying, Hey, you know, if we lay all this stuff out ahead of time, theoretically, you should find the same thing if you if you go and um, try to replicate it now because everything was laid out ahead of time and if it doesn't come out then obviously the researchers were lying or they fudged the truth a little bit so um, yeah I mean that's, or it's not replicable or or that yeah completely possible. All right, well, let's go ahead and thank all of our friends over at Live Science, Eureka Alert, and TechCrunch for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media or join our Slack for links to the original articles. Okay, Blake, we got one more story this week, and then I want to talk to you about Boston. All right, so what's our last story? All right, so this week there was everything from biotech, robotics, fintech, startups took the spotlight at Y Combinator's 26th Demo Day. So this is a batch of 124 total companies from 23 countries with presentations spread over two days. So from everything from marijuana soda to wind turbine cleaning drones and indestructible pantyhose startups were demoed, demoed their products in the break room of a parking lot. So Nick and I are going to go over our favorites from this Y Combinator demo. And for everybody who doesn't know Y Combinator or doesn't remember from last week, Y Combinator is one of the biggest startup incubators in uh, in North America. Uh, so famous for some of the biggest startups that come out of Silicon Valley, including Airbnb. So so this this full article is 64 uh, different startups. We're not going to go over all 64. If you want that, go check the ori original article. What Blake and I have done is we've gone through and kind of picked out our top five favorites uh, from that list of 64, and we're going to kind of talk about them as they pertain to human factors. So do you want to just go, uh, I'll, I'll give my number one, you give your number one, and just kind of go back and forth and talk about them? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so my number one, uh, this is not really ranked. These are just like, you know, 
This is this is the first one on the list. So this is called what? Passerine, I guess. So Passerine makes unmanned aircrafts that take off and land like birds, and they intend to sell it to companies to use for things like mapping large areas or lightweight cargo delivery, LIDAR surveying, and power line monitoring. And I think this is really cool. It's almost like drones, uh, but but bigger. And uh, it's data collection, and I love data collection. And it's more than that because it's, it's uh, also um, – Cargo delivery is in there too, but primarily data collection. I think it's super awesome. And it gets us more into that space where drones become so much more engrossed in our lives, right? From delivery drones to those just collecting data from things like power plants. I mean, this, I just think this is really cool. We see this across a lot of these startups in this list. Yeah. All right. So commentary on these are going to be a little light because we got so many to go through. Blake, what do we got up? What do you got for? All right. So I'm probably going to butcher this one, but I think it's called Aeronez. So Aeronos has built drones that clean wind turbines. So they believe that it's going to be safer and more efficient alternative to humans cleaning them. Uh, And these are just basically giant heavy lifting drones that they hope will eventually clean buildings and have applications for other industries like oil and gas and solar. Man, these are just the it's just amazing to me that we're going to use drones for so many different applications and something that could potentially save human lives, because I'm sure it's quite dangerous to be cleaning wind turbines, depending on, you know, multiple multivariate of factors. But it's just an awesome another application of this drone technology that we're seeing everywhere. Yeah. Quick side note. Um, uh, my mentor in grad school was actually studying falling risk. And you wouldn't believe that, like, people working on power lines are more likely to die from falling or serious injury from falling rather than uh getting electrocuted on those lines so that goes a long way to saying yes there is plenty of life-saving opportunities here with something like this that can that can prevent humans from going up and having drones do it instead lots of drone news (laughs) and potentially here and especially a lot of these startups it it's not necessarily taking away a job it's now creating a drone operator job so an opportunity for somebody to be operating a drone to do the job they used to do boom all right, my number two here was Visor. And Visor wants to turn top gamers even into even more skilled players. The startup analyzes esports gameplay footage to help coach users on what gaming skills they need to improve on. Now, the team analyzed 1.3 million minutes of footage in the past 30 days, and they boast over 39,000 monthly active users, growing 52% month over month since launching at the beginning of the year. So that's crazy. So these guys... This is this is uh, kind of near and dear to my heart because uh, one of my friends is an esports commentator. But um, this esports is is such a unique field where it's it's uh it's it's almost competitive. And I'm wondering if they can collect some sort of, like obviously video games have a lot of metrics associated with them. But I can see this very easily being applied to something else like real sports. Um, <laughs> you know where where you're just collecting a million different data points and trying to analyze what skills the players need to improve on. I think it's super cool to, to kind of go with this approach. Yeah, I do too, man. And you know, esports is just going to become bigger and bigger as time goes on. And so if companies like this, that are really trying to dive in into how to, Im- how to improve or enhance, you know, kind of training for esports is, is different as that sounds to people right now. I think it's really going to become commonplace over time. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. All right. What's, uh, what's your number two? Oh, number two, my favorite startup name of the list is definitely Haiku. So Haiku wants to do for apps what Unity did for games. So they're making an app creation tool that's meant for designers and developers to work together to create apps. Uh, They're going to launch this both across iOS and Android. And I don't know, Nick, I think I've seen this in in another couple of the startups mentioned in this page, but I really like this collaborative aspect that's allowing people to create websites or in this case applications that doesn't require a whole lot of upfront work such as coding or doing uh, a lot of like design sprinting. It's something you guys can, that people could work together um, quickly on and actually get some kind of product out. Cause I, I don't know for how many of our listeners have ever like downloaded something like unity, but there's so much power in that engine Oh, and they yeah. make it very simple for you to use. And something like this is just a, just another step in the direction for helping developers and designers put stuff together. Yeah, I'd be curious to see what the interface looks like. Uh, this isn't the one that's like designing mobile sites on mobile, right? That's that's something else. Uh, no, that's that's something else, yeah. Yeah, the, well, this is cool. I, I really like this idea because um, I wonder if it's just like, uh, if it just 
is sort of at these utility based applications or if it does it for games too because i know unity has a uh, mobile mobile uh plug in as well um i'd be curious to investigate that a little bit uh, let's see here. My number three was Proof. Now, Proof helps websites turn their, turn their visitors into purchasing customers. Uh, as an example, websites can show visitors how many people are currently viewing a product, and the idea is for those notifications to help convert people into buyers. Proof has, currently has 2,700 paying customers who see an average of 10 to 15% lift in conversions. Proof's long-term goal is to personalize the entire marketing funnel. Now, this is interesting to me. Only because they're kind of socializing, um, uh, 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 you know, like these e-commerce sites. Like, can you imagine looking at Amazon and seeing like, oh, wow, somebody just bought this. Okay. All right. Okay. Another person just bought this. Okay. Now I'm, I'm really considering this because more people are buying this. And, and you can kind of see what the buying rate is over time. Like how many purchases per hour, how many purchases per minute. Um and and how many people are currently looking at this thing? How popular is it? This this is cool to me because it's kind of socializing the idea of buying stuff online. And while I hate that from a consumer perspective, from a company perspective, this is uh, this has got a lot of potential. Yeah, Nick, there's definitely some kind of some kind of like missing out or fear of missing out psychology going on here because there's a website that I use that produces like limited edition or limited numbers and limited edition uh, clothing, right? It's just a, it's just a clothing company. And they do this all the time. They've been doing it for years where they just show how quickly once they drop a product, once you visit the website or on the mobile app, it says, oh, so-and-so just bought this thing to like get, get the feel that, okay, things are going to run out. And we're going to be sold out. And we only print one of these. So if you don't order it now, uh, other people are going to get in your nod. So it's it's definitely a great tactic and probably really smart for conversion rate. Yeah. All right. What's uh, what's your number three? All right. Number three. This is this was really exciting. There's a lot of, funny enough, there's a lot of uh, healthcare related and biotech startups in this. And so actually I had to pick a few. And this one's called Algo Surg Incorporated. So they have built an algorithm to, ins- to just simulate surgery. So they believe that robotics are definitely the future of surgery and developed a simulation called TabPlan 3D, which uses cloud technology instead of x-rays to help or- orthopedic surgeons prepare, using a, prepare for surgery using a 3D virtual surgery plan. So they have four patents filed for this and are also in the process of getting approved by the FDA. And Nick, you and I have, we've, Talk to the, we probably have beat this horse dead a few times talking about how important it would be for advances in AI and VR to help people practice surgery or get more hours in and get used to surgeries and whatnot. But this is kind of taking that in a, in a step in the right direction, right, where they're providing 3D surgery plans prior to something that's going to happen actually happen based off of actual x-rays so it's it's not just a training thing anymore this is like prepping for the real game so i, I just think this is amazing tech yeah it really is uh is is x-ray do you do we know if x-rays is the only uh information that they use to populate those or do they incorporate past uh past honestly surgeries nick as well? i think when they're talking about x-rays here they're saying that instead of only having that as something to access that that they're they're prepping it with more than just x-rays i'm assuming they would probably use them but i'm i'm hoping that what you're implying is right that they're going to collect data about this on over longer periods of time but we'll see yeah that would be money all right uh let's see here my next one was super medium and super medium is a web browser built natively for virtual reality you can see why i picked this one the team uh, behind the browser <laughs> That was perfect. Pre- previously working at Mozilla, uh, working on A-Frame, defining the web VR standard, which aims at getting apps and games off of your hard drive and onto the World Wide Web. So uh, th- there was this web VR uh, A-Frame thing where you could basically create uh, 3D environments in um, in your web browser, right? So it, it, you didn't even have to have any advanced software. You could literally create a, a 3D environment uh, on the fly just with these tools in your web browser. And... Um, Super Medium is working with developers to make their browsers the default hub for quick and impactful games and demos. And uh, there's a there's a beta of the app available now for the Oculus Rift and HTC Vive. So obviously, That's so cool, man. <laughs> obviously, I'm super stoked about this. Anything to get uh, VR 
a little bit more easily accessible to creators. Um, one of the one of the biggest hangups right now for people in the field of VR is like the uh, or or at least just the the layman people is is the the lack of accessibility. Right, you need this big powerful rig or or something that can uh, that is capable of rendering uh, these three D environments. Because sure, you could make it right, but you can't test it, and that's really half of what VR is. Is you need to test the things you make. So. The fact that they're bringing this accessibility is uh, is a ton of good news. Yeah, it really is, man. Like I got so excited when A Frame was really being worked on, and now that they're they're taking it a step further, trying to put it into mobile or trying to put it in apps for creators, it's so great. It's it's the only way we're going to get VR just way off the ground or further along than it already is. Yeah. What's next? Oh man, this one's so cool to me. I don't know. This is real nerdy about data <laughs> stuff, but anyway, Nerd. so this is called Screen. So it's a tool that sits in your web app and actively tries to prevent attacks. So it watches it watches the behavior of your users within the app to identify and block against any kind of SQL injections and cross-site scripting attacks. So it currently works with apps built on Ruby, on Rails, Node.js, and Python, uh, which are three of the heavy hitters right now. I don't know. I think we're, or especially right now, I think everybody has it on their mind, like the, the importance of data integrity and uh, Putting, th- putting small tools like this into web apps that you build can ultimately help you, you know, create a, a safer environment for apps that you create or your company creates. Uh, and I, I don't know, I really like startups that are trying to jump into the cybersecurity world because uh, I, I think it's a space that obviously just needs a lot of help in growing in far, as, insofar as like defining how we how we protect data what really what it really means when we're protecting somebody's data and just stuff like that so it's a it's a cool little application yeah we talked a lot about the the cybersecurity uh, over the last year you know and and uh this is good that it's going to be sort of incorporated in this stuff but um you know like we've seen movements from Google recently with with uh, ad blocking and trying to make best practices for ads and i wonder if there's going to be some sort of movement for cybersecurity as well uh I'd be curious to see uh, let's see. Is this my last one? Yeah. Voicery is my last one. So Voicery synthesizes ultra realistic computer voices that can use natural emotion and inflection and whisper or joke. 70% of the people prefer its voices to Amazon Alexa's and Voicery analyzes hundreds of human voices to train deep neural networks that power that power its product. Uh, so rather than trying to train a computer to mimic a single specific voice, voicery could be used to generate voiceovers, read the news, dub television shows, or dare I say it, even podcast. It's already got a letter uh, of intent for 300000 to make audiobooks. So that's crazy to me too. Um, but with more speech-enabled devices coming on the market every day, there could be a big market for something like this uh, for giving brands their own voice. Now this is this is both scary and awesome at the same time because you could kind of create your own persona. Like you could, you could create uh, whatever voice is appealing to you, right? And there's been a lot of studies on what's better, male, female, um, uh, demanding or assertive or passive or, you know, all these different attributes with voice uh, interfaces. And to give you sort of the freedom to make your own, I think is really cool. Honestly, Nick, this that's probably the biggest idea on this out of the sixty four that's just gonna be something that skyrockets because I mean I voice is just gonna get bigger and bigger from voice UIs to everything else like in home devices. But I think I think taking that like branding aspect of it and creating your own specific voice that you're now gonna you know, you're going to associate with a type of product or something like you're kind of like how we associate Siri or we associate Alexa with Amazon. I, I think that's a really, really smart choice. And I, I can't wait to see how that sort of takes off. I want to see if we can recreate our own voices. Could, could it like do it from a sample? I wonder. All right. What, what's the last one we got? Okay. So this is another nerd one, but it's called reply it or reply, rep, reply. Replay? It. <laughs> So it's an instant serverless computing platform. So it lets you write and deploy apps right from your own browser. They actually claim that it might be the easiest way to start learning to code, letting users build complex ap- applications with thousands of lines of code without a server. So I believe they believe that their cloud platform is perfect for building games and other interactive programs. And okay, so Blake, why are you telling us about something that has to do with programming? Well, you know, there's a lot of content out there right now about 
the interaction between designers, developers, and researchers, and just having a nice baseline understanding of how some of the web technology works can really help you out in having that having the communications that you're probably having to with developers if you're a human factors engineer or you're a UX designer or researcher. It can just give you a nice baseline. And I think more and more as we keep going on, it's going to having programs like this that really are easy for people to hop into. You don't have to have a server. You don't have to set it up. You don't even have to have, in this case, like a text editor to use. It just really helps cut the barrier to entry for anybody to learn how to code. And I'm always, always excited to see that kind of stuff coming out. Yeah, that's really exciting. Um, it's always good to get people that are working on two sides of the same coin to kind of see the other side and uh, communicate. And this sounds like it could do just that. All right, well, let's go ahead and get into our next segment. It came from... It came from... It came from... Not Reddit. We're doing Boston this week. Blake, you are in Boston, Massachusetts for uh, the Healthcare Symposium, and I want to ask you, how has your day been? What have you seen? What kind of interesting things are out there? And what can we take home? Oh, my goodness. All right, Nick. I have... I just took a took a kind of an easy day and went to the opening session with Lise and listened to a little bit about the talks about what's going on. But Nick, what I'm really interested in is what is going on in research right now in healthcare. And you would not believe the amount of the posters tonight at this poster session that I went to were all consumed with the application of VR, not only in the hospital setting, but also in a military setting for medical devices okay so it was my, just insane my first question is why am i not there hitting up all these vr places with you i'm so glad uh, you're there to kind of get the coverage but dang that's awesome so so like what's the most sort of unique uh application that you saw while you were there so the most unique one that i saw tonight okay this is, this is going to take a little bit of a different turn from just the vr we'll return to vr in a second but i i I think I told you a little bit about this in the start of the show, but Nick, we've, we've talked a good bit in the past probably year, but definitely in the past couple of months about prosthetics and the enhancements that have come to them through being able to, you know, think about it from your mind to be able to move your pro move a prosthetic around um, from having and, or from just having, you know, stimulation in the arm. Well, there, there's a prosthetic company that works with, and I cannot remember the name of the company, but they work with the university of central Florida and they develop prosthetic arms that are for kids. And the way that they, they actually work is that they just put little sensors that look like, you know, if you've ever seen like a butt, you know what buttons look like, right? You click them in. Well, it's sensors that click in onto the, onto the child's like arm or that's been amputated. And it just monitors for signals when they flex their bicep. And so when they flex their bicep to a certain degree, it'll clinch the fist closed or it'll move the the ar the uh, artificial arm up or down so it allows them to basically control their prosthetic arm with just using some of their some of their flexation muscles in their biceps right well so, so there's a company that or this particular set of researchers have taken it one step further because nick you and i have talked a lot on this show something that you and i both enjoy is playing video games um and believe it or not, it's pretty tough for kids that only have a prosthetic arm and one regular arm to be able to play video games, much less if they had two prosthetic arms. Um, so what these guys did, they've, they have actually kind of taken this technology that's based on sensing how your muscles flex and created a grading system in it. So now every time your, your muscles flex to, a cert, to like a certain intensity, say like 100% versus 50%, it creates different movements within a video game context. Um, so that was one of the most incredible things that I saw this week, that's, or today at least. That's really cool. I mean, we've seen sort of these applications where we, there's special made controllers for people who only can control with one hand or, or can't even control with either of their hands. Have you seen the guy who uh, who streams video games and he, he basically uses a controller uh, by manipulating his face? To control this thing oh i have not seen that that sounds incredible it's it really is something impressive to watch and the fact that we are getting to the point where people can just twitch their arms and play that's that's awesome i i love that because accessibility is really important for all aspects be it for uh simple day-to-day -day things or even especially for recreational things that 
you know people want to do but can't because of the input methods involved that's that's really inspiring well it is and the 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 thing that blew me away when i was talking to the main researcher today was that this is all happening within a 15 minute time frame like learning how to figure out how to you know gradedly uh flex that specific muscle into different different levels so that you can you know do different actions in the game for young children is very, very fast and it, and they do it so much better than people who actually don't that have all their limbs. Cause they, they kind of do comparative tests to see how, what the differences in, in performance are and people that actually have both limbs and try and interact with games in the same way are definitely not as good. And it, it's just, it blew me away that one, this is, a, this is giving people, like you said, much more access to, normal things that other kids have access to playing video games and just enjoying themselves. Plus, you know, the fact of having like a, an actual prosthesis that they can control a little more, um, than some of these more expensive ones that really are based off of brain signaling. Uh, but it, it's, it's also incredible that they can learn that it's able that you can learn that fast, how to do something in a completely different way than was ever envisioned for you to. Yeah, no kidding. All right. So we got time for about two or three more highlights and we can tackle everything else tomorrow on our bonus show how about that most definitely okay okay so this this is a really fun one to me because it was it was all about vr um <coughs> excuse me so it was all about vr and the context was for the warfighter uh and what what brought me to this poster was, was believe it or not it, it wasn't vr and it wasn't the fact that it was for the warfighter is because it was looking at diagnosing tra- traumatic traumatic brain injury um, in combat and then trying to make decisions based off of what those readings were. So in a, the gist of the idea here is, is to create a set of tools that are easy enough to be transported in pretty intense environments. So in warfare or in warlike conditions by met, by, you know, your kind of military medics. And what this entailed was it, it's a mobile app. So mobile software, uh, a VR headset, so a very ba- it was a very basic one. I think it was a Samsung, uh, one of the Samsung Gears, um, and then just a a very basic Xbox controller. Uh, so the idea was that you would be that if if somebody had a concussion or somebody was just in a blast or something something like that happened, and you were uns- the medics unsure. Okay, is does this person have a concussion, or are they able to continue on, or do we need to take them back in further to base? How do I make that assessment by just looking at them? Well, it's really really hard to make those judgments, but without like gathering some serious data from from their from their eyes and from also the the amount of blood that's getting to their brain. So what they do is they stick them stick this headset on them. Uh, and they actually run them through a battery of tests that are supposed to help you identify not just whether they have a traumatic brain injury or not, because uh, unfortunately, in, in this context, definitely, this is a, that's a given, right? You, you've been in some kind of bad situation, you've been thrown back or whatever, whatever it may be, right. but this is able to give more diagnostics than that. So, okay, they've had some kind of traumatic brain injury, what does that mean for them? And based on the tests that they run, uh, in the virtual environment with the subjects, they're able to gather enough information to give them, uh, to help them make decisions about, okay, is this person well enough to go back into combat? Um, are they, is the concussion so bad that we need to transport them out of here? Just things like that. And I just, I, I, you know, because VR, when I think of VR, I think of like really high power computers and, really intense headsets that I never would have imagined something being out in the warfighter context this early in the game. But that's, that's what, what's going on right now. And I just think it's an incredible use of the technology. Did they say what kind of tasks they're <clears throat> having them do? Is it, is it just like the standard uh, like concussive markers or, or, or is it something specific towards the, the, the medium of virtual reality? Yeah. So it's specific towards the medium of virtual reality. Cause the, the way the, data scientist for the project was explaining it to me he's like i you i can't simulate um i can't simulate what it's going to be like for them to be walking around back in combat by just talking to them or running Ah. the the basic battery of tests like follow my finger or any of that kind of stuff so basically what they do is they put them in the vr experience and they and 
forgive me guys because i really i don't understand the the technology of vr well enough to do this justice but basically what they're doing is they're providing them a forced context of being back in very jerky movements um where they're ha- their their eyes are having to actively follow a lot of different markers in the in their field of vision uh, so it actually creates a lot of motion similar to what they would feel if they were running or if they were again at another blast or any of that kind of stuff so it helps them understand like okay if this person's standing how do they do if they're sitting how are they doing if they have to go through specific movements from prone to standing up to running what does that do to them are they able to handle it from in the vr context and somehow or another that's able they're able to extrapolate that they're going to be okay or not okay for combat man that's pretty cool all right one more cool highlight and then we'll we'll pick it back up tomorrow yeah yeah yeah. okay so this this one was another so another vr one right um, again, military context, uh, just, just like a quick one before we get away from this last one. Um, what was really interesting to me as well was that although this is being funded and developed by the army, um, it's actually being tested also for sports. So in high school sports for football to try and like diagnose of whether, whether players can play more or also, um, being used in just kind of like hospital trauma units. So it's, it's got a lot of application from warfighter to consumer. So I thought that was oh, a, that's, that's also really a cool. nice little twist on it. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, so one more war, warfighter one with VR, this was a kind of a different spin on the medic again, but this was much more about what, what kind of what we've talked about before and a little, a little bit of an allusion to the startup I mentioned earlier where it's okay. There's a specific injury that we're coming across. What am I supposed to do? How do I treat this? If what are the best ways for me to go about it? And so basically what it did is based off of the, the injury a specific soldier is have has, it gives you a catalog that you can sift through inside the VR headset and kind of get an idea of how the surgery would go. Or how you would go about, you know, sewing up this particular kind of wound or treating this this large of a gash on somebody's leg. Uh, it's just one. It was an assistive technology or assistive use of VR to help train combat medics um, in theater. That's really cool. Oh man! So yeah, so, it, it was kind of nuts. So they're actually kind of looking at these procedures in real time based on whatever has happened to the soldier. Yeah, and it it was obviously very specific to the the type of injury because if if it was something like a leg injury where you've got a lot of arteries open, you don't have time for that. But in some of these cases where if it it was something that was getting infected or hadn't hadn't been treated correctly the the first round like on the combat field and now it's being treated like in a hospital outside of combat, it, it was a way for them to kind of figure out like, okay, this is what really should be done. Here's how I can fix that. Um, versus um, versus trying to do something on the fly, like sew up somebody's, you know, open arteries or anything like that in their leg. Yeah. All right, man. Well, let's go ahead and pick this up tomorrow because uh, I, I'm really excited to hear what else is coming out of that healthcare symposium. Well, that's it for today, guys. Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. Did you like them? Did you hate them? Let us know. If you guys have suggestions, you can jump on over in our Slack and let us know. You can also follow us all over social media. You can head on over to the LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. We'll talk about Cambridge Analytica next week because uh, we're still waiting to see how that all pans out. <laughs> Twitter, we're <laughs> at uh, H-Factors Podcast. Be sure to check out our SoundCloud. Leave us a comment over there. Or you can send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you're feeling saucy, leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If you're out there at the Healthcare Symposium, Please leave us a voicemail. Let us know what you saw. We might even have some special guests on the show this week. We'll see. You can also support us on our Patreon. Please, please, please go check that out at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. We spend a lot of time revamping that and would really appreciate your support. If you can't do that, just go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. Make those good because we like good reviews. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, thank you for coming to us live from Boston and breaking down all the news stories. Where can our listeners find you if they want to talk about VR and warfighter performance? Oh, you guys can find me at the Boston Healthcare Symposium this week. 
But you can also find me on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram at Don't Panic UX. Excellent. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Come talk to me if you want to commiserate about losing all your data saved. Thanks again for tuning into Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it, it depends. depends. Join us tomorrow for our bonus episode. No, seriously, I looked and I was like, all of my data? Really? Seriously? Come on, Microsoft, what are you doing over there?